Hello and welcome to video one for week nine. In this video, I want to talk about what I identified as one of the major themes of the course, the idea of symmetry. And what we mean by symmetry is something more general than the sort of public notion of symmetry of a shape being preserved. I want to preserve all sorts of things. I want to say what transformations, in our case, linear transformations, preserve shapes, preserve operation, preserve objects, preserve all sorts of things. And we can think of many of the definitions in this course as preserving something. Even back to the original definition of a linear transformation, what was a linear transformation? Geometrically, it was a thing that preserved linear subspaces. Algebraically, it was a thing that preserved linear operations. So the notion of symmetry I'm going for in this course and that exists throughout mathematics is the notion of transformations that preserve some kind of thing, and the kind of thing can be quite general. Before I move on to sort of the definitions of this video, I want to remind you of a couple pieces of notation. So all of the matrices that are n by n with coefficients in the real number is written mn of r. Uh, matrices that are invertible, n by n matrices that are invertible with coefficients in the real numbers are written gl. gl stands for general linear. It's called the general linear group. Just a reminder of those notations. I can look at what we did a couple of weeks ago with the determinants and also consider that a kind of symmetry proper property. The determinant of a matrix is the effect of the matrix on size and orientation. If the determinant is equal to 1, that means that the matrix preserves size and orientation. So the determinant, by setting it equal to the special value 1, also has a preserving effect. And we have a nice notation for these matrices as well. This is SLN of R, or all the invertible matrices of determinant 1. This is called the special linear group as opposed to the general linear group. SL stands for special linear. And then the new matrices I want to define are things called orthogonal matrices. And I apologize a little bit for this term because it's sort of annoying because we already have the notion of orthogonal vectors, which is vectors that are perpendicular to each other. So an orthogonal matrix is not perpendicular to anything. It's just a property, a type of matrix. So the terminology here is a little bit strange, but let me go through the definition. A matrix is orthogonal. Again, not orthogonal to anything, just orthogonal end sentence. A matrix is orthogonal if it preserves lengths. And this is a little bit different from what we had for determinants of preserving areas and volumes. They're connected to each other, but they're not exactly the same thing. If I wanted to write this algebraically, if I have a vector v, and I look at its length, if I look at its length before, and I look at its length after the transformation, then the lengths have the same size. So it takes a vector of length 3. It can move it all sorts of places. It doesn't need to be in the same position, but it has to go to some other vector of length 3. Um, these can reverse orientation. There's no guarantee that we preserve orientation because we could flip things around and still have the same lengths, reflections, flip things around and have the same lengths. All that we have is the property that the matrix preserves lengths. I want to get into some more properties of orthogonal matrices, but I need to detour for a couple of definitions first. Uh, this first definition here, this is a thing called the Kronecker delta. So this is a lowercase Greek letter delta. Um, and it has two little indices i, j, and the Kronecker delta is, is a sort of little shorthand symbol we use for seeing whether two indices are the same. So the Kronecker delta is 0 if the indices are not the same, and 1 if the indices are the same. And the way this sort of works, so I write delta 2, 4, then that evaluates to 0 because 2 and 4 are the same, but if I write delta 7, 7, that evaluates to 1 because 7 and 7 are the same. So it's, it's a little shorthand for testing whether two different indices are the same. And it's a nice shorthand to have. We use it quite frequently in mathematics. And I'm going to use it in the next set of definitions and properties. So I wanted to make sure it was clearly defined. This is called the Kronecker delta. I also wanted to define the transpose. I've used this a little bit before, but I don't think I've actually clearly defined it in the notes of the video. So let me do that now. If I have a matrix, the transpose, a uh, exponent t is the matrix where the columns and the rows are switched. An equivalent, we can think of that as reflection over the diagonal. And here, look at this example. I have the row 4, negative 3, 0 becomes the column 4, negative 3, 0. I have the row 2, 12, negative 3 becomes the column 2, 12, negative 3. I have the row negative 15, 2, 3 becomes the column negative 15, 2, 3. So the rows become columns and the columns likewise become rows. And if I look at the diagonal, 
negative 4, 12, 3. The diagonal stays the same, but things across the diagonal are flipped. So this 2 and negative 3 become negative 3 and 2. Those are flipped. So 0 and negative 15 become negative 15 and 0. This 2 and negative 3 become negative 3 and 2. So I flip everything over the diagonal, and that has the same effect of changing rows and columns. All right, so that's the Kronecker delta, and that's the transpose. With those two definitions, I can give a bunch of alternative definitions of orthogonal matrices. So this is the one I started with. Orthogonal matrices preserve lengths. It's equivalent that they preserve dot products, and that makes some sense because dot products are related to lengths. Preserving dot products seems a little bit more general, but it turns out to be uh, equivalent to preserving lengths. If all the lengths are preserved, then the dot products are preserved. And by preserved, what I mean here is that if I do a dot product before, or if I do a dot product after, I get the same result. This is neat. An orthogonal matrix, its inverse is its transpose. So the transpose we just defined, in general, is a different kind of matrix entirely. It doesn't have, this, have to have the same kind of properties at all. But for orthogonal matrices, the transpose is actually the inverse. And we can state this as A times its transpose is equal to the identity. So this is just restating what the previous equation said. This makes these matrices really easy to invert because the transpose is easy to calculate. If you want to think about con computational complexity, then calculating inverses involves row reduction, which is a lot of work. Calculating transpose is just re reordering your array, which is as simple an algorithm as possible. So having easy to calculate um, inverses is really convenient. We can think of the orthogonal matrices in terms of their columns. So I'm going to think about an orthogonal matrix A as column A1, column A2, all the way to column AN. So an n by n matrices, matrix. And these columns are all vectors in, a, in RN. And it turns out that a matrix is orthogonal if any two different columns are perpendicular to each other. I could also state that that is dot product. So this means that A1 and A2, their dot product is 0. A1 and A3, their dot product is 0. A2 and A3, A2 and AN. All of these dot products are 0. All of these columns are perpendicular to all other columns. And all of the columns have length 1. So if I look at these vectors, if I look at the length of this vector, this vector is length 1, this vector is length 1. So I get a bunch of perpendicular vectors of length 1 as the columns of my matrix. And I can actually restate this in, the, in terms of this Kronecker delta, because if they're perpendicular, this means that if i and j are different, this dot product has to be 0. But if i and j are the same, then since the length of, is 1, the dot product of vector with itself, which is the same as this length squared, has to be 1. So this is a really sort of succinct way of capturing the previous line, that the dot product of AI and AJ for any two columns is zero if they're different and one if they're the same. And that's what the Kronecker delta does. It says that things are zero if the indices are different and one if they're the same. And lastly, another preservation thing. Preserving angles is almost the same thing as preserving lengths, but not quite. So an orthogonal matrix is a matrix which preserves angles and also has a determinant of plus minus one. And it turns out if you have both of those things, that's equivalent to the original definition. All right, that's quite a lot to process, but it's really interesting that this orthogonality, this preserving lengths, has a whole pile of alternative descriptions. That's a, a really neat property of these matrix. There's a, there's a whole bunch of ways to get at their their nature and their properties and their the way in which they operate. And we can use all of these to our advantage when we're doing proofs and calculations. So some properties of orthogonal matrices. In R2, the only orthogonal matrices are the rotations and the reflections. You think about this, you rotate things, you haven't changed angles, you haven't changed lengths. You reflect things, you haven't changed angles, you haven't changed lengths. And it turns out that all of these sort of special matrix properties um, that I listed in this slide, these are all true of reflections and rotations, and you could test that. If a matrix is orthogonal, so, it, so is its inverse. That sort of makes sense. If going forward doesn't change lengths, then going backwards won't change lengths either. All orthogonal matrices have determinant plus minus one. So orthogonality preserving lengths is very closely related to preserving size and areas and volumes, but we could have this difference in orientation. If I have two orthogonal matrices and I compose them by matrix multiplication, then the composition is also orthogonal. That makes sense. If I do one thing that preserves lengths and I do another thing that preserves lengths, then doing them both in sequence as one operation will preserve lengths as well. We have notation again for the set of orthogonal matrices. This is called the orthogonal group. It's written O n, 
uh, of the coefficients if you want. It shouldn't be an n here. O n of r. Sometimes it's just written O bracket n if the coefficients are assumed to be known. And we have likewise the special orthogonal group is the orthogonal group where we insist on not only plus minus one, but here the determinant equal one. And those would be things that preserve angles and orientation and size, uh, area and volumes. They're preserving a lot of things. So a lot of really tight symmetry properties in the special orthogonal group. Let me give you an example in R3. And this is an interesting example because I said in R2 the rotations and reflections were the orthogonal operations and there wasn't anything else. This is something that is unique to R3 that is neither strictly a rotation or reflection. So this is a dilation by negative one. So it's going to take everything, every vector in R3 and just multiply all the components by negative one. We had a vector A, B, C. Then we get negative A, negative B, negative C out of this matrix action. So it takes everything and sends it to the opposite point on the other side of the origin. That's not strictly a reflection because there's no plane over which that's reflecting. And it's not a rotation. There's no rotation around any axis that's going to do this in R3. It's sort of turning everything inside out. Um, if you actually thought about a ball centered at the origin, then this transformation would literally be deflating that ball, turning it inside out and inflating it again. And everything that was inside would be outside. Everything that was outside would be inside as everything gets flipped around. So it's neither strictly rotation or reflection. And in higher dimensions, there are many, many other types of orthogonal transformation that are neither rotations or reflections, even though that's the case in R2. And lastly, I wanted to give you a more general example. This is typically what orthogonal transformations look like if we write them in exact values. I have three columns. And if you test the dot product of any of these columns, you'd find that the dot product of the columns is equal to zero. Let me go look at the first two. So I can ignore the denominators because I can scale a vector and not change its direction. So if I sort of looked at five, negative three, negative two, dot, negative three, negative seven, three, then that's gonna give me five times negative seven is negative, sorry, this is a negative three, is negative 15 plus 21 minus six. That is in fact zero and then scaling it by root 38 or root 67 is just gonna be zero over root 38 times root 67, it's still gonna be zero. And you could check that the first and the third and the second and the third are also orthogonal to each other. So the two properties is any two columns have to be orthogonal to each other and all the columns have to have length one. That's why I have these weird square roots. If you look at five squared is 25, plus three squared is nine is 34, plus four, two squared is four is 38. So we need to divide by square root 38 to get a vector of length one. Likewise, three squared plus seven squared plus three squared is 67. So we divide by root 67. And these weird numbers, negative 23, if you square these and add these up, you get 25, 46. So if you divide by that square root, this is also a vector of length one. So this is sort of conventionally what orthogonal matrices tend to look like. So we've got orthogonal or perpendicular columns and then a bunch of factors that we divide by, usually the square roots, so that these vectors have exactly length one.